The year is 2010 and I had spent a large portion of my time on my PlayStation running through first person shooters with a whole bunch of friends. Hardly surprising, considering that 2009 saw the release of Modern Warfare 2 and not three years prior Resistance Fall of Man had taken up most of my time. You see, I grew up on a wide variety of games, some of which are the likes of Army Man 3D, a weird shooter adventure style game, XCOM, a fantastic turn-based strategy game and other such games that piqued my adventure interest, such as Final Fantasy and of course the classic adventure games of the likes of Legend of Zelda, Super Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie. Yet, something was missing. I never really experienced the RPG or MMO genres when I was younger, and it wasn't until I saw a trailer by Bandai Namco Europe on YouTube showing snippets of Demon Souls did I really know what I was missing at the time. The trailer's probably still out there to this day. Throughout the trailer there were snippets of reviews touting it as the best RPG of the year and a brutally tough experience and it immediately grabbed my attention. Maybe that's what I needed. Something to really be challenged and if this game says it's tough then maybe I should give it a go and see how challenging it really is. Fast forward until roughly March 2010 I find myself at my local JB Hi-Fi, a game store in Australia, purchasing a copy of Demon's Souls and not a day goes by where I don't thank myself for such a wise purchase. The rest is history. I posted my original, and admittedly, horribly cringy playthrough videos over 10 years ago. Regardless, the playthrough was completed and the game series had seen EP after EP arrive. Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, Bloodborne, Sekiro, Elden Ring. Yet Demon's Souls still had die-hard fans and I found myself revisiting the game on almost a yearly basis, my PS3 essentially becoming an annual harlot for just Demon's Souls. We all thought that that may have been it until finally, after all of this time, a remaster. This video will serve as a medium in which I discuss many aspects of Demon's Souls Remastered and callbacks to the original game. Of course, throughout this video there will be sections in which I discuss what I am doing in the game and give tips, tricks, advice or whatever information that may be helpful during gameplay. I won't be showing every minute of every level, so just be aware of that or this could turn into a 4 hour long video. This video doesn't serve as a walkthrough, let's play or guide of any kind, this is simply Demon's Souls, a commentary. Straight after our introduction, we move into the character creation menu, a staple in every single one of these Souls games where you're able to, as the name suggests, create your character. We get the progressive new option of body type rather than gender identification, which I have seen some negative feedback for, but honestly, I really couldn't care less. Although one thing that intrigues me is that if you're going for a gender neutral approach on the whole character appearance or identification thing, it doesn't make too much sense to still have armors locked behind different body types. Oh well. We do, in the remake, have a much wider variety of character customizations, as well as the inclusion and addition of different voice tones, so that's kind of cool. We have the standard for character creation, where we input our name and choose from a range of different classes, each with a gift that you can select. Thankfully, there are none that are broken, although the ring is a point of contention, such as the likes of Dark Souls 1's Master Key. After finishing our character, we are greeted with an overview of the story. Okay, so, the story of Demon Souls is being laid out right in front of us during this cinematic. Effectively, the greed for more souls and power had lured the Old One from its sleep, and it had then blanketed the land in a colourless demon fog and bringing with it a myriad of demons. Thus, it is up to us to either put the Old One back into its slumber and restore order to the lands, or become its new avatar. It is here in this introduction we get a snippet into some characters we may or may not meet along our journey. Valifax, Bior, Yurt, Urbane, Skurva, Astraea and Garvinlin, and Sage Frake. The story, for whatever it's worth, is fine for the game. It effectively was the progenitor of the new generation of Souls-like game storytelling where they only give you snippets of the main story and only enough to get the gist of things and the rest is up to you to uncover throughout this immersive world. For context, a large portion of this world can be uncovered through reading descriptions of items throughout the game and by interacting with NPCs and reading through their dialogue. Interestingly enough, Demon's Souls offers you a chance to experience the journey to the Nexus, the central hub of the game, in the form of a tutorial level. Many games obviously start with a tutorial, but not many Souls games continue with one to the same degree as this. It does make me wonder why Dark Souls 1, 2 and 3 don't have tutorial sections with the same sort of clinical direction this game does. Perhaps this game's more beginner friendly. Either way, it isn't really anything nuanced or fancy.
I noticed that the menu looks crisp, clean and beautiful as expected by a remake. As you would also expect from this menu, you can equip and unequip weapons, armor, consumables, rings, arrows and bolts and look at your stats. This menu also shows you information about world tenancy, though it fails to be specific and spell it out for you, often leading to some confusion down the line. I will discuss this as the video continues, as it can be a core element of gameplay. The tutorial does a solid job for what it's worth showing you the ropes, the essentials of movement and combat in a relatively safe space. There are messages on the ground to direct your attention and teach you literal movements and passive fodder mobs to help you get the hang of things as you maneuver your way through the castled environment. Speaking of learning a lesson, after getting chopped up a whole bunch, I find myself needing to scoff down some watercress or uh, crescent moon grass. Demon Souls utilizes herbs and spices, much like Colonel Sanders, to help you restore health and mana. There are different flavors of herbs and different types of spices to aid you on your journey through Boletaria and beyond. The conclusion of this tutorial is the Vanguard Demon, a seemingly unbeatable and insurmountable obstacle that endeavors to cleave you in two and leave you for dead. It can be beaten, however, you run into him in World 4-1 and it serves as a comparison to highlight the growth between the then and now. Although, if you do manage to beat the Vanguard in the tutorial, you'll find yourself facing the Dragon God, which promptly lays you flat on your back. Withdrawn from its vessel. Let strength be granted so the world might be mended. Soul of the lost, withdrawn from its vessel. Let strength be granted so the world might be mended. So the world might be mended. After being smushed into a red paste by the Vanguard Demon, we're introduced to the Nexus. The Nexus is a central hub of the game in which most NPCs will reside and where most of your business will be dealt. It, from the get-go, comprises of a crestfallen knight, stockpile Thomas, blacksmith Baldwin, a worshipper of God, and a passive monumental. After World 1-1 has been beaten, you will find the Candle Maiden and Freak's Apprentice appear. On top of which, this is the area where you select the Archstone you'd like to touch to be teleported to the respective world and specific Archstone location. There are a total of five Archstones to different lands, with only the first one being available pre-monumental. These Archstones are Volataria Castle, Stonefang Tunnel, the Tower of Latria, Shrine of Storms, and the Valley of Defilement. The game does not tell you which world you must travel to after you finish World 1-1, making the game's difficulty fluctuate depending on what route you take. One could, theoretically, finish World 1-1, then move on to World 5 for a larger ramp up in difficulty, in comparison to World 1-2. Regardless, we touched the first Archstone and it teleported to the outskirts of Boletaria Castle. World 1-1. Okay, so heads up here. From Worlds 1-1 to 1-2, there's a lot to unpack in terms of game mechanics and things we can learn. Call it the extended tutorial. Perhaps I'm reading too much into this, but looking behind where you spawn rewards you with some decent moon grass for healing, signaling to us as a player that you can find little bits and bobs in the world just slightly off the beaten path. It is at this point I'm reminded about equipment load and one of the more annoying aspects of the game, item burden. You see, much like other games that follow it, you have different levels of agility based off of your carry weight. There are three types of rolls, fat, mid, and fast. Usually anything over 75% equipment loads a fat roll, less than 50% is a mid roll, 
another 25% is a fast roll. And this information can be found on the right side of the equipment screen. Anyway, there's even more things to unpack in worlds 2-1 and 2-2, so there'll be quite a lot of discussion in those worlds as well. Once I have all that under control, the slow walk up to the gate has me experience a few things that the tutorial somewhat showed me, and that is ambush and crowd control. The combat within Demon Souls, and indeed most of the Souls games if not all of them, lends itself to one-on-one -on -one combat. The skill of the player determines how well they can deal with the ambush and gank style fights, and walking up these stairs has me ambush numerous times and confronting numerous enemies at the same time. One of the things that I want to commend and comment on Demon's Souls 4 during World 1-1 is how much it teaches the player. I would make an argument as to why this should be the tutorial, if you want to call it that, over the run to the Nexus. They could place the same types of messages down on the floor for newer players as they did in the tutorial and allow them to experience this level as a proper tutorial. That isn't to say that the current tutorial isn't a learning experience, it's just merely watered down, because of course it's meant to be. After dealing with these friendly gentlemen, we're given a message on the floor by a fellow player which warns us of an ambush, one of the things that Demon's Souls does quite a lot of if you haven't noticed already. You see, the placements of enemies within this game is particularly important, and it has to do with proper level design. We'll go into level design in more depth later on, but for now I will say that when you develop a level for a character to move from point A to point B in a relatively linear passage with no or little intention of backtracking, enemy placement becomes paramount. Place enemies in nonsensical ways and you find yourself having too easy of a time progressing forward. Place enemies in positions that cater to going forward and backtracking and you find yourself having too easy of a time progressing forward as well. This is a major difference between Demon Souls and Dark Souls, but as I mentioned before, I will go into this in more depth later. This game does a great job within World 1-1 of teaching you subtleties that will help you on your journey. Take for example this fine young fellow. His flaming sword alerts you to the fire effect, as we have previously seen and dealt with this on the stairway up to the castle. From this encounter, the player has also noticed the barrels blocking the way. I'm not sure whether or not he's designed to attack the barrel and set himself alight, but the process of doing so shows us as players that these barrels, and indeed things throughout the game, are flammable and you can use the environment to your advantage. As I progress downwards, I am ready to use my newly gathered information on the next mob and, uh, he fell. I shall endeavour to talk about the AI as the video goes on. Throughout the world of Boletaria, you will have many options in regard to direction that you can go. Some paths lead nowhere, with others leading to shortcuts that enable you to loop back around. Given that these levels, for the most part, are designed for you to go from the aforementioned point A to point B, it makes sense that you have a shortcut to get you back to where your progression points are. These shortcuts don't really serve much purpose when progressing backwards through the level, and as Death Orbit forces you to start from point A and the very beginning, Shortcuts are a nice inclusion to somewhat alleviate this game's difficulty. A quick trip back to the Nexus after collecting the Jade Hairpin sees us get an item from Stockpile Thomas. It reminds me that NPCs within this game have unique quests or objectives that you can do for them. I'll talk about this a little bit later on too. During our journey throughout the level, we stumble across this fine glowing fellow. Gives me a chance to try out the menu option, Dialogue Boost Mode, and... It does nothing. What the hell? At any rate, this is Ostrava of Boletaria, a knight who seemingly is stuck in a precarious position. We can help him out, or not. It's really up to us as a player, but since I'm a nice guy, and we all are nice people, I will help him out. This is step one in Ostrava's quest series, but again, I'll discuss NPC quests later on. These hoplites on the way down to the boss door outline a key theme within Demon Souls, and that is that enemies, aside from humanoids and their backstab vulnerability, have open vulnerable points. The hoplites take next to no damage from the front, but almost full damage from the rear. They're also practically made of fucking kerosene and can be set aflame quite easily. A fact that I already know, but a new player may experiment with. Which leads me to the following. 
As we come towards the boss fog door, a large and ominous door from which a scraping spear had been thrown through, I'm reminded that throughout the level I've been fed an absolutely amazing amount of pine resin and fire bombs, which is a great way of the game nudging and directing us that these items are there to be used and may be of use within this boss fight. No other level gives you this degree of consumable materials prior to a boss fight, so it is yet another way that World 1-1 acts as an extended tutorial. As the game progresses, you will acquire a variety of consumable materials that may or may not aid you in upcoming fights and bosses, as they have different strengths and weaknesses that can be exploited with these objects. But enough about that, let's continue our journey. Now that we have beaten the Phalanx, our first boss, we're given the task to speak to the Monumental. And the Monumental asks us a simple yes or no question after they give us more exposition about the world we are in, and it is now that we have unlocked the rest of the Archstones to explore. This world is our oyster, and our journey can begin in any one of these five directions. I, however, journey forward, continuing with the quote-unquote extended tutorial that I said before. On the left, we spot Ostrava, the gentleman we helped in World 1-1 fight off a pack of dreglings. He's got himself cornered down a later section of the level, and we can decide whether or not we detour to help him. This is just one example of NPC quests within this game. World 1-2 is the Lord's Path, or better known as the Dragon Bridge, aptly named for it being mostly a bridge and having a dragon swoop down on us. We are invited to learn the timings of the dragon, so we may make safe passage across the path forward. Bloodstains on the floor give us a chance to see the mistakes of others, as we note that that poor unfortunate soul had been done in by the aforementioned dragon. The rampart towers at each section give you space to go up and down. After clearing the top, I elect to go down, as it allows me to bypass the dragon fire and gives me a chance to find a Strava. Under the bridge, we run into a merchant, one that I elected to ignore in World 1-1, and behind him we see an item. This signals that we can approach this section from another direction, and on the way back we spot stairs leading up to another tower, letting us know that this level can be tackled in multiple ways. We can either go up on the bridge, or below underneath. Throughout the level, we have had to battle relative hordes of fodder mobs, and at the moment they're not that difficult. As we cross the bridge to the final section, we're greeted by another fodder mob, but this time with a slightly different challenge tacked onto it. The Blue-Eyed Knight. The Blue-Eyed Knight adds a little bit of tension to the mob, and this becomes a recurring theme throughout the game. The locked door on the left or right, depends on your perspective, suggests that we may need to revisit this level and could potentially backtrack, although not exactly through the level like we just did, but a separate section of it. Up the stairs, on the opposite side, is a crystal lizard. These are recurring throughout the Soul series to one degree or another, and in this game they drop random stones each time you kill them. They also respawn after a boss has been killed, so it might be handy to note down the locations of them to revisit later. Further on and up we go, we get our first stone of ephemeral eyes, as well as a variation of a lotus, of which we haven't seen before. A quick inspection of them both shows us that the stone brings us back into our human form when in soul form, and the lotus counteracts poison, signposting that this is a status effect that we may soon have to deal with in later stages of the game. This is a great way of showing us what is to come, and at least allow us to have some preparation for that. The World 1-2 boss is an imposing figure and is accompanied by a myriad of crossbow soldiers on the parapets. Failing to deal with the soldiers results in a more difficult fight as we now have to use crowd control while a larger enemy is present. We can either run up on the side of the tower and kill them, or ignore them.
failing to kill them will knock them down onto the floor and then you will need to crowd control the soldiers while also fighting the Tower Knight. The Tower Knight fight requires you to chop at his ankles in order to get access to his head and in comparison to the original it seems more difficult in the sense that you do far less damage to his head than previous. It shows me that perhaps this difficulty in AI might have been improved on from the original. So this boss teaches us about weak points or vulnerabilities of bosses and is a great extended tutorial for the players if they can manage it properly. Attacking the heels enough will bring it down and leave its vulnerable point open. Having a weakness or vulnerability is a quality a large portion of these bosses share. After the fight, we naturally want to progress forward, but are unable to do so, a thick fog blanketing the door asking us to slay an archdemon. We haven't yet heard of these, so the player will see this naturally as a dead end and will be forced to go to another world in search of an archdemon to slay. This makes world 1 unique from the rest, as from the moment it can be started, it cannot be beaten until another world has been beaten first. Oh well, at least we get a decent farming spot. Backtracking from the Tower Knight Arch Stone, these blue-eyed knights aren't difficult to deal with and they always drop some good quality moon grass, so time to stock up. Speaking of stocking up, I now have 20,000 souls so I can beef myself up quite a bit. I noticed at this time my sword's durability is running low as noted by the red bar beside my weapon, so a trip to the blacksmith sorts this out, but it's important to keep an eye on that as attacking some enemies can cause its durability to deplete faster than others. I snagged a wand earlier in World 1-2 so I'm able to buy a spell and a tunic. I select enchant weapon as a nod to my earlier series 10 years ago. After leveling, it's time to head to world 2-1. At the beginning of world 2-1, we swing a left up the stairs and kill a crystal lizard to gain more upgrade stones. Speaking of which, there's another merchant here. Our second one so far. This merchant sells you some entry level upgrade stones, and I'll talk about upgrade materials towards the end of world 2-1. The enemies throughout this world are called Scale Miners. These miners are incredibly resistant to most damage types aside from piercing attacks, so naturally this is a good time to mention damage types throughout the game. In Demon Souls there is a large range of weapons that consist of daggers, swords, large swords, very large swords, curved swords, katanas, axes, large axes, hammers, large hammers, spears, pole arms, fist weapons, crossbows, bows, catalysts and talismans. Whew, that's a lot. Each weapon deals a specific damage type and enemies are susceptible or weak to those damage types. These types include physical, normal, piercing, slashing, blunt, magical, fire, bleeding, poison and plague. Weapon and damage types can be combined. For example, a large club that has a dragon enchantment on it will deal blunt fire damage. Different enemies have different resistances to bleed, poison, plague, magic and physical, so it's sort of handy to know what you're going up against before you go balls to the wall, and this level and section serves as a great learning tool for this as you'll subsequently deal no damage. After slashing the miners a couple of times, you realise you're doing way less than before, so naturally resort to another style to compensate, and finally discover it has a weakness. Ah, I died. How wonderful. You'll see a lot of soul form during this commentary series, you can be assured of that. As you can see, and as we learn from the beginning of the game, death cuts our health in half normally, or three quarters with a cling ring equipped. Being dead does have its benefits, and the cling ring really helps this a lot. This is a perfect chance for me to talk about character tendency and world tendency just a little bit. Each archstone area has a tendency, and that tendency shifts between black and white, but it isn't as binary as that. World tendency can be all different shades of grey as well, and the blacker the world tendency, progressing towards pure black world tendency, the more difficult the level or the world will play. Enemies become stronger, there are black phantoms that roam the world in specific areas, but the plus side is that they have higher drop rates of items, and they drop more souls upon killing them. Consequently, with white tendency or progressing towards pure white world tendency, enemies are much easier, will deal less damage, and you won't find random black phantoms throughout the world. On the flip side, the souls you get as they die are lowered, and their drop rate of items is also lowered. There are numerous ways in which you can increase or decrease world tendency. The best way to progress towards pure black world tendency is by dying in body form numerous times and killing friendly NPCs throughout the level. 
As a result, being in soul form for the majority of the game isn't a bad choice as you won't progress your world towards pure black tendency. The way you progress towards pure white is easier by killing bosses and black fandoms and, obviously, not dying while in body form. Character tendency is related to how you as a character are morally and can either be pure white or pure black, and obviously all shades of grey in between. This can be achieved in a relatively similar way than world tendency, and on top of this, helping other players defeat bosses progresses your character tendency towards white, whereas killing other players and NPCs progresses your character tendency towards black. It's important to note that these tendencies can impact areas that open up to the player as well as items scaling. It's all rather complex, but you get the gist. Anyway, continuing onwards. <laughs> Good to see that the remake has some original flair in it. I remember how pathetic this guy was back in 2010. His timing with the rock is still way off. The boss of World 2-1 is the Armored Spider, and it looks far more challenging than it actually is. For the most part, the hug it in close mentality actually works quite well. Just remember to have your shields up. As we walk through the last sections of the level leading up to the boss, we picked up some more interesting upgrade stones, and this boss will drop a pure stone variant upon its death. This is a good time to talk about upgrade materials. Each weapon can be upgraded with specific materials. These impact the way that the weapon damage type works. For example, Spider Stone, which we receive from the boss, will make our item sticky and will give it a higher dexterity bonus, but lower the strength bonus. It's also specific to bows. The following is a list of the upgrade stones. Hard Stone, Sharp Stone, Clear Stone, Grey Stone, Dragon Stone, Sucker Stone, Mercury Stone, Marrow Stone, Moonlight Stone, Moonshade Stone, Faint Stone, Spider Stone, Cloud Stone, and the worst one to farm by far, Blade Stone. All of these stones consist of four different types. Small shards, large shards, chunks, and pure. The rarest of the upgrade materials, if you're to ask anybody who has finished this game, either the original or the remake, is the pure blade stone. Then there is the outlier, a melt stone. The melt stone restores your weapon back to its original setting. And of course, there's the colorless demon soul to upgrade your boss and special weapon arsenal. Speaking of which, I think it's time to finally upgrade my sword. Uh, sorry about the information overload, by the way. Onward. Ah, fucking hell. Alright, one of the horrible things in my opinion is the platforming sections within this game. Thank god they're few and far between, but I'm going to bring this up again on the trek to the Flame Lurker. We meet our third merchant here who will, if prompted, trap you behind this bear bug, who will explode, killing you. I know better, and now you do too. So you dispose of the bear bug first, then he'll have no choice but to talk to you, and you can survive the encounter. This, as you may have noticed, is Patches the Hyena, a scavenger. A man who can and will trick you at every turn until you question whether or not he is genuine. He is, in some way, shape or form, in every iteration of this Souls game series. Either way, for now, we have access to a pretty good merchant. Haven't for the life of me any real idea how to get to the boss via this route. I never really walked through the caverns and killed everything, and I opted to take the easier and arguably less annoying route. Which, speak of the devil, is dropping down this chasm here. From memory, it seems easier to pick the landings than it was in the original, but Demon Souls feels really weird when you drop. It almost makes you feel like you're floating down, and the damage is as odd as Elden Ring's fall damage. Either you take a lot, or you just flat out fucking die. We approach the world 2-2 boss, the Flame Lurker. He promptly hands me my ass, and he's noted to be one of the more difficult fights in the game, so 
I'll come back as soon as I have a few more tricks up my sleeve. World 4-1, or the beginning of Shrine of Storms, is one of my personal favourite worlds. It continues to play on the notion that crowd control is paramount as if you get stunned by these skeletons rolling towards you, which give me flashbacks to bone wheel skeletons by the way, then you can meet a swift death. 4-1 has traps littered throughout it which are easy enough to dodge, hug the wall and it'll be A-OK -okay for the hallway dart traps and run up the stairs for the trap with four dart holes in the wall to avoid being insta-killed. We meet one of the more notorious enemies throughout the franchise and indeed one of the types of enemies I like to call a highlighted enemy. I'll clarify this more in World 5. This is the dual katana black skeleton, and only the black phantom variant in World 4-2 on pure black world tendency is stronger. I think aside from two or three of the other enemies, namely the giant depraved throughout World 5 or the mind flayers throughout World 3, you won't find a more difficult enemy to deal with. Passing by to pick up a very handy weapon for a magic build. Present affix, upgraded through moon shade stones, passively restores your mana. This world features a sequence break in which you can, when timed right, run across the tower and fall down the outside for a lovely ring. The Regenerator's Ring. This passively restores your HP and when paired with an Adjudicator's Shield it makes for some nice health recovery over time. This sequence break effectively skips 60% of the level, so I come back. Ah, the Vanguard Demon. So now I'm ready to show you the difference between then and now and... Well, that's lame. How the hell does he just sit there getting smacked by my spells? Now, some of you might call this a cheese strategy, but if the AI isn't reacting, then how the fuck is it my fault? Either way, I showed him my growth from the tutorial. I think. I picked up a copper key from somewhere in the level and make my way down to find yet another merchant. This marks the fourth one we've seen on our travels so far, with there generally being one specific to each world. Starting to see a theme here. Speaking of merchants, there is a different type of merchant present throughout the game and several others in the series. In this game and in Dark Souls 1, 2 and 3, there are these things called Crow Merchants. Demon Souls has Sparkly, Dark Souls 1 has Snuggly, Dark Souls 2 has Diner and Tillo, and Dark Souls 3 has Pickle P Pumperum. Each one of these crow merchants serves roughly the same function. Drop items that correlate to what they want and you can generally get an item back. Drop shiny things in Demon Souls, soft and warm things in Dark Souls 1, silky and smooth things in Dark Souls 2, and seemingly random shit in Dark Souls 3 to be rewarded. So, I drop an Org of Guidance, which is shiny, and then I forget to exit out and reload to receive my drop. Eh, no matter. It only would have been 10 white arrows, nothing really game-breaking there. 4-1's boss is the Adjudicator, a rather large mass of flesh with a cleaver jutting out of its abdomen, or perhaps it's the bird on the crown of the head. Who knows exactly? Either way, as outlined before, numerous bosses within this game have vulnerabilities, and it just so happens that attacking this cleaver sticking out of its guts causes it to writhe in pain and fall down, which gives you access to the golden bird up top. After committing side. He goes down, and we're up a tasty 14,000 souls. I think it's time to revisit our heated friend. Alright, this time things go a little different. Utilising my newfound tricks, such as my soul arrows, hitting him with the Crescent Falchion for magic damage, using a lot of healing herbs, and some well-placed Ossian help, we deal the killing blow to the Flame Lurker. Now the Flame Lurker's soul is quite unique in comparison to other bosses. You see, each boss soul can be used to consume for more souls, traded for a spell or miracle or weapon upgrade, but the Searing Demon Soul or Red Hot Demon Soul in the original can only be consumed or given to Blacksmith Ed in order to actually forge boss souls into weapons. So that's exactly what we do. We just chuck it to him. We give it to Blacksmith Ed after we unlock that shortcut back in World 2-1. This is fantastic, although I wonder why the ability to forge weaponry from boss souls is not just something that Blacksmith Ed already knows from the beginning. 
This is because I wish that there was more boss souls used this way, where you had this difficult choice to make. Obviously, so far, the difficult choice is you consume it or forge it to a weapon or spell or something like that. But imagine if you could sacrifice it for something else, gaining no weapon or spell. This, in my opinion, would highlight one of the key points of the game, which is to overcome the corruption that comes from soul greed. Then again, the point can be made that you are the Slayer of Demons, and therefore you have a choice whether or not you keep those, and giving them up isn't something you should consider. Oh well. Alright, so for the Dragon God, I actually want to unpack a couple of things. First, I'm going to touch upon the nature of boss types, and there seems to be three or four different boss types. It's a little bit arguable. There's traditional, where you just go in and learn the fight. There's alternative, where you have mechanics or a mechanic that makes them different. For example, a phased fight with a single encounter or transitions slash transformations. There's gank fights, where there are just bosses that are more of the same and don't really offer much in the way of any innovation and attempt to overrun the player. And gimmick fights, where the boss has some mechanic or item that it just throws at the player. As a result of that, I consider a gimmick boss one where there's an object or action or item that's specific for that fight. We see this in later renditions of the Soul series with examples of Fume Knight, Yorm the Giant, Deacons of the Deep, Ancient Wyvern, High Lord Walnir, Executioner's Chariot, Burnt Ivory King and the Better Chaos, just to name a few. However, not all gimmick fights are created equal and we'll see one further down the track just within this game. Gimmick bosses tend to be very reliant on their gimmick, and when done well, they have some fantastic moments. Next up, aggro and AI. Boss AI in this game isn't so crash hot. I can't really wait to experience the man eaters and see if they're any different. I see that blue point went for damn near the exact same feel as the 2009-2010 original rendition, and it does remain true to that. I can appreciate this. It's not such a huge deal, but for some bosses with gimmicks such as this one, it really makes it annoying. Finally, perhaps this is my personal bias coming in, but Dragon God has to be one of the worst bosses in the entire Soulsborne series. It just plain sucks. The AI is so goddamn janky. I know that the eyes glowing red cue you in to when he spots you, but it's so flippant with how and when he sees you that there's just no clear consistency. Sometimes it spots me and he does nothing. Other times it spots me and he punches me for all of my health. Other times he spots me when I'm hidden. It's a horribly executed, gimmicky puzzle boss with no rhyme or reason, and his damage is flat out ridiculous and gives you practically no room for error. On top of that, the only way of navigating this ridiculous arena he's in is just by smacking the rubble that blocks the way forward. It's so lazy. If I was to create this fight with new and updated mechanics and perhaps a new engine, I would implement a stealth mechanic similar to the way that Sekiro implements stealth, especially around the giant white snake sections. There could have been a plethora of ways that you can approach this boss, yet he is a frustrating, failed mess. He is, of course, an archdemon and is somewhat important to the game's narrative, although I've yet to really figure out exactly how. Anyways, my rant about the worst Demon Souls boss is over. On to World 4-2. World 4-2 is a lot different from 4-1. Where 4-1 was quite open and for the most part outside, 4-2 sees us navigating a cavern-like system. It's here where we start to see a bit of a ramp up in enemy difficulty. The Reapers present a challenge and the apparitions they spawn in do as well. Although identifying early on in this separated example gives you knowledge for the future. If you were to kill the apparitions only, they would return until you dispatch the Reaper. This is very similar to the necromancers in the catacombs where the skeletons reanimate until you have found and killed the necromancer. This ramping difficulty makes sense, as this, if you follow the numerical pattern of worlds 1 through 5, is the last level with regular enemies in it prior to the final world of the game. This right here is a man we've seen before in world 2-2. Patches, and he's back, leading us to treasures with all guides of guidance. 
However, if we walk too close, we get a cutscene showing us that all he really intends on doing is betraying our trust and taking our stuff once we wither and die. Not all is lost, however, as down here we're acquainted with none other than Saint Urbane, a person mentioned in the introduction of the game. He is the miracle merchant that will go back to the Nexus once he is saved. We need to save him by disposing of a black phantom that blocks the exit. On the rock in front of us is an unobtainable item, of which we'll come back later and collect. Yet another instance of world tendency just out of our reach. After walking back to Patches, we bury the hatchet and he now returns to the Nexus as our merchant indefinitely. The boss of World 4-2 is the old hero, obviously graphically updated from the original, meaning that we no longer get to see the insanely polygonal package that poked out as he landed. This is what I'm referring to. Now his gooch for the most part is covered by cloth, same as his eyes, which is an interesting concept so early on in the Soul series. A blind boss. Off of the top of my head, I can only think of two other bosses that employ this to a degree, and they come in the forms of Seath the Scaleless in Dark Souls 1 and Osiris the Consumed King in Dark Souls 3. Regardless, the tactic for this boss is actually much simpler than you think. With proper use of the Thief Ring, you can walk around and chop him right as he swings, then run away and repeat. Sure, this takes time and isn't very engaging, but at the very least you can make this hero an easy fight. So up until I started writing this script and going over it numerous times, I didn't really get what I was feeling in relation to boss quality. I think it's important, at least right now, while facing the Storm King, to look at them in context. When you really get right down to it and observe each boss within Demon Souls, none of them really stick out as the best designed or most difficult boss in the franchise, with obviously most of those titles going towards the ones later in the series. Of course, this is due to how old it is and the time period in which it came out. I really wish I could peer into my prior self's perspective all of those years ago when doing these for the first time, but none of them now feel difficult or majorly innovative. Of course, living is never guaranteed. Whether this is a limitation of the engine, time allowance on the developers, or just lack of innovation when testing the waters, I really have no idea, but it's interesting to at least, when looking at these bosses, look at them through the lens of the early 2000s. God, how far we've come in the last 12 years. Not just in regard to game development and mechanical progress, but in terms of idea innovation and player skill. This right here is the Storm King, yet another gimmick boss. This boss, unlike the Dragon God, does not have to be engaged in the traditional gimmick fashion. You are free to hurl arrows and spells at it until it's dead. I wish they did that for the Dragon God, it would have made it far more bearable. The intended path is to walk down to the shoreline and collect the Storm Ruler, a two-handed heavy sword, and the attack of this weapon, specifically in this area, projects a wind-like slash towards your targeted foe, allowing you to kill it from a distance. Handy. Especially as the Storm King really only descends from the clouds after you have dispatched six Storm Beasts, or the Stingrays. 
Melee builds who have no access to magic or bow and arrow are forced to use the Storm Ruler, but I honestly advise you to use magic or ranged if you have strong enough weapons at your disposal. After the Storm King is felled and we've gotten revenge for my boy Steve Irwin, we can make our way down to the Archstone and collect another pure variant of a stone. Pure Cloudstone. Right, so here's where I would like to discuss level design, is there's a stark contrast between World 3-1 and World 3-2. World 3-1 is like a maze in a sense, with cell keys needing to be found and used in the correct spots to unlock more keys and open more doors. Not only that, but each key is specific to a certain floor. Some of the keys that can free NPCs are far off of the beaten path or simply just in another area of the world. As for bearings, do you spawn on the ground floor? Level 1? Level 2? Level 3? Who knows? I kind of wish there was a more immediate and obvious way to know, as it would help greatly with navigation. World 3-1 seems to be designed to come back multiple times, or at least backtrack in it, as it, in comparison to almost every other world, has most fodder mobs locked away in cells, and the few mobs around the world, such as the Mind Flayers, roam, meaning that their dynamic movement creates tension regardless of you travelling forward or backward. This feeling seems to be unique to this specific world. World 3-1 is quite vertical, which is not really maze-like to begin with on paper, but its winding and confusing stairways and lack of direction mean that it is quite easy for a player to become lost, or run around in a loop going from floor to floor and falling through well-placed holes, landing back from where they came from. Ironically, the better part of the level is the outside area, and there are two ways in which you can access it. Continue down the winding stairway until you find yourself outside, or travel down a very dark set of hallways with mined flares along the route, opening up to two large metal doors. Throughout this maze, there are two NPCs to free and one merchant to find, as is often the case, each world seemingly having one merchant in it. Sage Frake, yet another mentioned in the introduction story, is stuck here and needs to be freed. Another NPC that is stuck and slowly passing away is Rydell, whose name has now been changed from the original where he was called Rydell. Unfortunately, he doesn't scream like he did in the original. Break, especially, is a part of a quote-unquote quest that we got from his apprentice way back after we beat World 1-1. You see, Demon Souls has a lot of NPCs that require a checklist of stuff or perhaps a specific action or actions. For example, Ostrava needs saving multiple times, Frake's apprentice wants you to rescue Frake, Sasuke wants a magical sword Makoto, Blacksmith Ed wants a demon soul, Stockpile Thomas is after closure of his family, Saint Urbane's disciple and indeed even Urbane needs saving, Yurt and Mephistopheles require items and NPCs killed, and Selen needs a crest for proof of her brother. These quests and indeed the dialogue that comes before and after you finish is what ties us to the world and the characters that we exist in. We don't really have to help anybody, of course, but most of these NPC quests are sort of on the way and aren't really too far from the beaten path. Perhaps it's just me here, but I can't really think of another Souls series game with the same level of NPC involvement, aside from perhaps the Unre questline from Dark Souls 3. Then again, actually, as I'm going over this script and doing additional research over and over again, I'm noticing that each game has incredibly in-depth questlines. Either way, Demon's Souls features in-depth interactions with NPCs that transcend beyond a regular conversation and can be completed or progressed through world and character tendency. After we have effectively escaped the maze, we're met with a cutscene of one of the most annoying obstructions in the game, the Ballista Tower. Ironically, the best way to get around it is to go through it. Time the fast roll the moment it shoots to allow yourself to dodge roll with iframes through the arrows and progress towards the back of the tower, pulling the lever and making the path safe to travel from now on. Right before we get to the boss, I want to touch lightly upon PvP. As I was walking around, I was invaded by this fine human Speedy 2013. This is the only time throughout my entire playthrough in which I get invaded by a human. And this serves as the first time during the entire game I was invaded and indeed interacted with another human. This place, on average, tends to be more active than others, perhaps only second to the red eye stones you can drop in World 4-1, as the archdemon of this area can be a human player that has invaded you. This is very similar to boss fights such as the Looking Glass Knight in Dark Souls 2 and Half-Light Spear of the Church in Dark Souls 3. 
At any rate, it seems this person was really trying to get the hang of PvP, and now that I've disposed of this minor inconvenience, it's on to the boss fight. Prior to the boss fight, you're encouraged to go up the stairs to the right of the giant staircase and interact with his lovely NPC sitting down casting a spell. He says he... I won't cause you trouble. I won't. But indeed, he will cause us trouble. He will. He casts a spell that brings the boss back to life indefinitely, and the only way out is to arch stone shard, neck seal binding, or die. A Fool's Idol is a weak, gank-style boss where the most dangerous thing in the room, ironically, are the blue traps on the floor as they stun you and allow her and her clones to get some sweet, sweet soul rays into you. Somehow, I miss every single one of them, which for the most part trivializes this fight. The congregation around her are just there to annoy you and block your path. The best way to identify the real idol from the clones is notice the one with no health bar above their head. Then, simply walk up and start swinging, and she goes down very easily. Ward 3-2 is a stark contrast to 3-1. Rather than mostly be indoors and maze-like, it's outdoors and quite open for different passage. Rather than be vertical at like the previous level, it's very large and spread out over arguably the largest single section of the entire game. There are moments of verticality, sure, but definitely not to the same degree as the last level. And now, I suppose, is as good a time as any to discuss AI. Look at this shit. What the fuck is this? The AI in this game is... janky. I don't really care about the AI being kept the same or changed, if I'm to be completely honest with you, but it's at least a moment we can talk about it. I'm not really quite sure how the pathfinding and decision making works with bosses and enemies, but whatever happened here ain't it. Looking back at the Vanguard Demon in World 4-1 reminded me that this indeed is a remake. I read somewhere online that... Quote, Blue Point aren't game developers, they're makeup artists. Now that's fine and all. But that means From Software's old AI sucked a fat knob. I am glad for the most part it has improved over time. Within this game, most enemies or bosses can be cheesed, and I may even employ one of these cheese strategies in the future just to show you how broken they can really be. Right now, it makes me wonder if the man eater AI is still the same as it was. Throughout this level, we need to kill a total of eight channelers, four at two sections, to break the chains that hold up this large, pulsating heart in order to access the boss. I love this level design, this is exactly what I wish most of the levels were like, as it means you don't unlock shortcuts per se, but your objective is the shortcut. After completing both sections, death does not see you need to retread through shortcuts, but merely walk up to what you unlocked and get to the end. Imagine, for example, in World 1-2 where you have the Dragon Bridge. What if, at the end of the bridge, you climbed the parapet and had a ballista that you're able to use and shoot at the dragon as it continues to breathe fire down time after time, needing you to time your shots well, finally resulting in you killing it. Of course, this is a watered-down example and a fantasy, but the death of that dragon means that your run back through the dragon bridge is no longer troubled by dragon fire. And it still would be optional, of course, just like it is now. Look, there's a lot of theory crafting around these ideas, and the notion of a large run back to the boss after failing it must be considered to, but I digress. We've spotted some more guides of guidance, and these show me two things. One. Hey, I can go there. Two. Hey, last time I followed those, I got kicked down a hole. How important that is to learn. Here we have yet another member mentioned in the introduction. Yurt, the Silent Chief. He seems shady. He looks shady. Is he shady? Should we judge a book by its cover? Yes, yes we should.
Look, I didn't do that for no reason, right? Yurt will begin killing NPCs in the Nexus if left for too long, so it's best to dispose of him now. Plus, we get his armor, which has fantastic resistances. Okay, the boss of World 3-2 is the Man-Eater, or Man-Eaters, as this is a gank-style boss. No phases, no tricks, just plain old two of them. The brazier in the center is important, as the platform on which you fight them is quite thin, rather high up, and they knock you back. So a fall from this height is certain death, meaning that you have to run all the way back and battle the Black Phantom Iron Flayer on the way up the steps. I am glad to know that this AI is still jank. He just randomly turns around and fucks off. Great stuff. This boss is more about splitting and crowd control rather than learning what happens. And sometimes you can get extremely lucky where he'll just piss off for a good 30 seconds, leaving you free to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the other one. Or you can get really unlucky where they both buff themselves at the same time. Either way, we use the same tactics we do with all gank fights. Separate, kill, and then repeat for the second to net yourself access to the next Archdemon. The run to this arch demon has to be the worst fucking thing that this game throws at you. I commended the level design in World 3-1 and 3-2 being tremendous examples of what a level should look like, and now... Now we have this shit. These odd centipede enemies are weak and serve no purpose being here, and the two black phantom mind flayers in tight corridors are just plain cruel. Problem with these enemies is that if you get knocked down, you most certainly cannot get back up again, and they will indeed keep you down. They will stun you, suck something out of you, explode, stun, and suck once more. Not only that, but these Black Phantom variants are tanky as hell. The penultimate boss of the Tower of Latria, if you can call it that, is the Archdemon, Old Monk, or rather a sentient gold cloth. The husk of the thing sitting on the throne law-wise was the husband of the Queen of Latria who was banished from Latria, the husband, not the Queen, but returned with demons and power which came from the Golden Robe. Upon entry, the husk slash old monk, whatever, summons a black phantom to fight. This is where PvP comes into play from World 3-1. If, by any chance, people are on and they aim to invade you, much like Speedy 2013 attempted to, you may find yourself versing a player. Trust me when I say I tried and tried and tried some more, and I could only ever find an NPC version, a Black Phantom wearing the same outfit as me, save for the upturned golden headdress and an insanity catalyst and claws. The catalyst does some insane, <laughs> no pun intended, damage, and the claws don't tickle either. As the boss's health gets lower, passive homing soul masses begin to spawn and shoot forward. They're an easy dodge, but don't get lazy like I did. After defeating him and our third Archdemon, we're now free to move on to World 5. Throughout World 5-1, there isn't a whole bunch that can go wrong, except actually there is. A large portion of the world is on a precipice, so small steps in the wrong direction will see your character plummeting into the abyss below. 
The enemies within 5-1 aren't exactly the strongest, and I'll make a point right now to look at any difference between the weird flurry they do here compared to 5-2. In 5-2 they can quickly become a problem. This level's difficulty so far lies in the player's ability to deal with groups of enemies that come from seemingly random spots all the while being cautious of your surroundings. There are a few ambushes scattered throughout the level and a couple of wooded areas that break away when stepped on, creating a pitfall or a trap to your death. There are holes everywhere. In the original, killing enemies here will see a lot of corpses down in the boss room, and the same is still true for this remake as well. As is expected, I suppose. This world, like all others, has a unique merchant. This one comes in the form of the filthy woman. She begs us to buy things so she can feed her son, and in the original she seems far more disagreeable and angrier than this version. It is at this exact point in time, I wonder, despite the clearly updated dialogue and voice acting, did it really add much more to the game? I'm actually going to attempt to show voice dialogue comparisons between Ostrava in World 1-4, and see how they compare a little later on in the video. Just past here is a giant depraved, which is one of the examples of a highlighted enemy that I spoke about earlier. Now, I can elaborate. To me, a highlighted enemy is a key enemy within the world that stands out from the others and is generally far more challenging than the rest for what it is worth. For example, World 1 has the fat officials. World 2 also has the fat officials, but one could argue that the bear bugs are it. World 3 has mind flayers. World 4 has the black skeletons. And World 5 has the Giant Depraved. There really isn't that much to talk about for World 5-1, so I make my way towards the boss, the Leechmonger. I compare the Leechmonger to Pinwheel from Dark Souls 1 for a few reasons. One, they're both extremely weak to fire. Two, they both don't really offer much in the way of challenge unless you just get flat out careless. Three, they can both be accessed rather early on in the playthrough of the game and doing so can benefit the players considerably in regards to soul or items that can be made from a soul. Obviously there's no right of kindling in Demon Souls though, so ignore that part. As you can see, I try smacking him with flame toss, but it really doesn't do too much, so I just go for the old caveman unga bunga method and ignite my weapon with fire and start smacking at his ass. Boss down, easy done. World 5-2 has me wanting to discuss quite a few things about the game. First, item limit. Okay, so fuck this. I've spoken a little bit about this before, but I want to go over a couple of things. Reducing the number of herbs one can hold is fantastic. I'm really glad to see that you can no longer carry 99 of everything because that trivialized the game's difficulty much in the way that Life Gems did in Dark Souls 2. Despite this, I think 99, 50, and 25 are still somewhat too high. 10 to 20 could have been a sweet spot here, but then I'm really unsure as to how this would impact difficulty and rationing of items throughout the levels. As a result, I think they did a great job just ballparking it. Although one thing I hate is that the game, with the item burden, encourages you to bank your stuff at Stockpile Thomas. Awesome. Great. Love it. It clears your inventory and your menu, but whenever you pick up an item you've already collected and placed with Stockpile Thomas, it appears in your quick bar automatically. This is such a pain in the ass, honestly. I think the original did the same thing, but I don't know why they couldn't have improved on this. The number of times I had to unbind a stone of ephemeral eyes or some fucking lotuses because I'd already banked them and had none in my inventory was just flat out annoying. I like to keep my quick bar clutter free and organized, so I really just jammed a spanner in the works. Next up, look at how beautiful it is. Like honestly, just look at it, soak it in. Bluepoint did such a fantastic job with their remake, and the graphics really give the game the credit that it deserves. I honestly couldn't be happier. Not only are the graphics better, but the item menu, weapon, spell and item art, the blood effects, lighting and sound design are just phenomenal. It's fantastic. I know I'm looking at a really drab section of the world, and you might say, why focus on 5-2? Look at it, it's a fucking swamp. But that's my point. They can make this dreary muck heap look gorgeous, and for that, I really must commend them. Now, status effects. 
As you can see, for this area, I've elected to go with my Regenerator's Ring and the Adjudicator Shield that I collected in 4-1. This means whether I get poisoned or not won't matter as my health won't tick down faster than I can regenerate it. This is because, despite the quantity I have, Lotuses are finite. The Swamp poisons the character, and maybe we've all been blessed to see the status effect build up bar, but I really wish they implemented that from the other games. I know that the original doesn't have a build-up bar, which is fine, and in the remake it's fine too, but it's really hard to know how much your equipment and rings affect your resistances to these status effects. It's quality of life for a reason. One could make the argument that the inclusion of these things in later games meant that these were errors in this game, but I digress. Finally, Black Phantoms. This right here is Manny to Mildred, or perhaps the original unnamed NPC that the rest are modelled off of. And during this fight, we see the world do what it is meant to do. Great level design right here, and that is work against us as a player. The environment is such that the player's agility and dexterity is lowered significantly, all the while Mildred's here is unchanged. This makes a somewhat easy fight turn into a more annoying and difficult one, because dodging is almost a non-option unless you find a solid bit of dry land, or you just tank through her heavy shots. This is what I like to see, and what I commend as good level design, because it turns an ordinarily easy encounter into a more challenging one due to the environment. Either way, I die. Huzzah. Great. Each world has Black Phantoms somewhere in them, either passive or tied to world tendency. World 1 has 3 leading up to King Alarn. World 2 has the double clubs at the bottom of the mine shaft. World 3 has numerous mind flayers in the archer prior to the fool's idol boss fight. World 4 has the Katana Wielder near St. Urbane, and World 5 has Mildred right here. Radio, so this right here has to be one of the trickiest non-world tendency sections of the game. This is where we have the environment playing against us with our highlighted enemies. We have two Giant Depraved and a Depraved Shaman. Get too close and the Shaman poisons you with Poison Cloud and the two Giant Depraved come steaming over to smack your ass. Best way to handle this, honestly, is do what you always do for gang-style fights. Separate and barry yourself off, then tackle the weakest one last. So, there you go. That's a tip for this section. It's not really easy to run around this section here, either. This level has probably one of the most significant shortcuts, as it literally leads you back to the Archstone. Of course, that means you're meant to circumnavigate the entire Swamp of Sorrow, but because of the nature of this level, it really helps a lot in the event that you die at the boss. Speaking of which, here's the boss. The Dirty Colossus. He's a lot like the Leechmonger, except he can walk. Honestly, for the supposed difficulty of the worlds that they both inhabit, these are some of the easiest bosses to kill. The Dirty Colossus is cloaked in wooden armor that breaks away after a couple of swings of your sword, or in my case, a couple of flame tosses. The most annoying mechanic are these flies. They're similar to the leeches from the Leechmonger, whereby if they stick to you, they will slowly deal damage over time. Standing behind a torch has these flies that he shoots out of his hand, hitting it and sparing you some pain. He is again, like the Leechmonger, extremely weak to fire, so if you have that, you can apply it to your weapon. Circle around his ass and keep swinging and you have yourself an easy 33,000 souls. Go forth, Galvin. May you be unharmed. Maiden Astraea is an interesting archdemon, but before I get into that, I want to discuss music. One of the only things I haven't discussed yet. The music in this game has been updated. Surprise, surprise, but I'm not really sure whether it's beneficial. 
That's not to say that the music isn't extremely good, and the orchestral score that accompanies bosses in this remake is fucking fantastic, but the original is not without its charms, and in some places I would almost prefer it. Interestingly enough, the music within this boss arena doesn't begin until you throw the first attack. Now, this is absolutely my own personal bias here, so feel free to ignore my opinion, but I have preferred Australia's original score to this one. Take a listen. I have tried to match them as close to each other as possible, but the original one to me screamed of sorrow and sadness, as there wasn't much in the way of instruments playing over the top of each other. It felt raw, whereas some of the sections of the newer version don't sound like they belong to me. Personally, I felt that the original soundtrack was meant to reflect loss of hope and despair, not heroic triumph. Then again, you are technically a slayer of demons, so maybe the heroic triumphant music is to reflect you, not the boss. But if that's the case, why is Australia's theme in the original sorrowful? Regardless, Shinsuke Kida, if I'm saying that right, composed the score of both the 2009 original and the 2020 remake. But perhaps he looked back at his work and saw the original version within the remake. Who knows, who am I to say? Right now about the fight. This is, in my opinion, one of the greatest Archdemon fights in the entire game, if not the best. Because her lore is different and unique in that she didn't come to kill, consume and grow, she came merely to help those suffering, forsaking the church. She is unique in that defeating her doesn't require you to kill her. She is also unique as she technically is not a demon. You have a choice whether or not you engage Astraea in combat while her bodyguard Gal Vinland is swiping at your heels or whether you flat out waste her bodyguard with her just giving up the fight entirely. You can kill Gal, then walk to her. Kill Gal, then attack her. Stand up on the precipice and rain arrows down on her, then kill Gal. Kill her, then talk to Gal and he'll give up. So many options. I really like how there's at least more than one way to approach this boss fight and I wish a lot of the Archdemons were more like this. Now, we're at the home stretch. As we open the door that was occluded by Fog, now free to us after we have slain an Archdemon, a fat official taunts us. This NPC is one that we will follow throughout the duration of the level, for the most part, culminating in the boss room. First time players, in some ways, are led to believe that he will be the boss of the area. Skipping forward quite a lot, disposing of a red-eyed knight and a couple of goons, we find our final merchant of the game. It's the same one as World 1-1 and 1-2, the depraved merchant making his return. He sells some pretty reasonable stuff at a semi-reasonable price here, so it's not that bad of an idea to pick something up, especially if this is the world that you continued before defeating your second, third, or fourth Archdemon. Although coming here this late in the game and investing is silly because we already have way more than enough of what we need. Making your way throughout the winding towers and the small alleyways littered with enemies and traps has us walk down the steps to a fat official blocking the portcullis and on the other side, blocked off, is a Strava of Boletaria, screaming for us to help him out once more. He is being chased by two red-eyed knights and a soldier this time who are effectively left to help him out while he goes and runs and hides in a corner, almost literally. After helping him out annoyingly for the second last time, he gives us a gift, pure clear stone. Then, meanders about the level. His questline is almost complete. 
Somewhere along the way throughout the level, we picked up an iron key ring off of a fat official, no doubt. This key ring allows us to walk back toward 1-2 and through the previously locked door. Disposing of yet another fat official down here rewards us with yet another key. A bloody iron key. And lets us free Bior, yet another NPC mentioned beside Valifax in the introduction of the game. Bior is invaluable as an NPC. So freeing him really helps us later on. We can also travel down this short path to find that item behind the depraved merchant we saw in World 1-2. It's a tower shield, the heaviest shield in the game and the one that the tower knight uses, albeit on a smaller scale. The bloody iron key that we collected opens the gate near the entrance of World 1-3 to a locked up NPC who we cannot save just yet. The original only required the official's cap, yet the remake seems to require the entire getup. Why is this something that they decided to change and not add in anything else? Eh, oh well. I'll come back here later. The boss of World 1-3 is the Penetrator. <laughs> Funny name, right? Well, for this late, or I suppose early in the game, he isn't that much of a challenge. His grab attacks, which you should avoid and I fail to dodge, can deal significant damage and aren't really anything to scoff at. But as he is there penetrating me, Bior is there penetrating him. Bior trivializes this fight as he is extremely tanky and hits like a Mack truck. Well, second last Archstone boss down. After we penetrate the penetrator, we head back to the Nexus and collect our official's gear to free our locked up NPC, Yuria the Witch. She, much like Sage Frake, will exchange demon souls for powerful spells, except these tend to be focused more on the raw damage output rather than some versatility. She claims that her magic is of a dark nature, but who cares really? World 1-4, the final world we need to tackle, hits us with three Black Phantoms straight out of the gate. They are the quote-unquote human forms of the World 1 bosses. One is the White Bow Phalanx Ulan, the other is Alfred the Tower Knight with the Scraping Spear, and the last is Metas the Penetrator. I'm not making these names up by the way, these come from the original and official guide. After we clear those three annoyances, we progress upwards to yet another dragon bridge. This time, killing the dragon is not a bad idea. Although I realise I'm ill-equipped, so I'll go and buy some heavy arrows to come back with a vengeance. But before I do, I take a trip to the stairs of Ostrava of Boletaria, as he imparts us on his final request to slay his father who has strayed from the path. He gives us a mausoleum key. Access to the mausoleum in World 1-1, which I will do later off camera. I want to talk about some NPC dialogue. I mentioned some time ago how I wondered if the updated dialogue added much more to the game. And here is a contentious point. In the original, Ostrava sounded more desperate and helpless, whereas now he sort of doesn't. Oh, it's you, is it? My father is up above. <laughs> well, what's left of him anyway? He's transformed into a fiendish demon. I began this quest in a search for truth, but it seems I was a fool to even try. Please, kill my father. In his degenerated state, he can only bring peril to the lands. This key fits the Boletaria Mausoleum. Inside the mausoleum are my father's two swords, Soulbrand and Demonbrand. Use them to bring an end to this madness. My father is up above. Ha, not something like him anyway. A demon in his shape. I began this quest to ask my father his reasons. To drag him back to the path of righteousness. Please, kill my father. In his depraved state, he can only bring peril to these lands. This key opens Boletaria's mausoleum. Inside the mausoleum lies Father's sword, the Demon Brand, twin of Soul Brand. Use it to bring an end to his madness. 
I don't really know how I feel about this. In the original, there seemed to be much more emotion in the voice of Estrava, where his grief is slowly overcoming his hope and will. This doesn't just apply to Estrava of Boletaria. I find myself caring more about the original voices than the updated ones, and the same goes for characters like Bior, Blacksmith Ed, and Stockpile Thomas. Th that hairpin, that belongs to my daughter. Then she didn't make it after all. My dearest little baby, may she rest in peace. That ornament, that belongs to my daughter. Then she didn't make it after all. My dearest little baby. May she rest in peace. There. Don't waste my time. I'm not here to chit-chat. Yes. That's the one. A red, hot, demon soul. Demon souls. They're like powerful spirits. Some can even bless weapons. But doing so requires a powerful flame, invigorated by a demon soul of scorching heat. Yes, that's the one. A searing demon soul. With it, I can forge new breeds of weapon. Mm. Who goes there? Have I been freed? You're the one who saved me. I'm called Bjor, the elder of the twin fangs of Boletaria. I thank you. You deserve a handsome reward. Only I have none. <laughs> ah, you killed that blooded sluggard for me. I'm called Bjor, the elder of the twin fangs of Boletaria. I thank you. You deserve a handsome reward. Only I have none. <laughs> The dialogue with almost every NPC in the original was incredibly evocative. It ranged from Blacksmith Baldwin and the filthy woman's cynical attitude to the joyous laughter of Bior to the meek discussion of Thomas. That isn't to say that the voice acting is bad. It's just different and not what I expected. And for me, that took a little away from the experience, especially at how large a portion of the story is uncovered through dialogue. At any rate, we kill the dragon and save Bior from becoming a flame-grilled meal, kill Estrava in his black phantom form, and make our way up to the penultimate boss of the game, false, uh, or, uh, sorry, old King Alant. I am to tackle him fair and square. Okay, so this is what I meant before when I said cheese. Back in World 3-2, I said that most enemies or bosses can be cheesed, and I may even employ one of these cheese strategies in the future just to show you how broken they can be. So, here's one. And what better one to display it on? As we slowly watch the old King of Lance health wither away, we can discuss and ponder a few things together. Namely... Now, this is the effective end boss of the game. This is obviously not true, but it is also true. You see, if you wanted to beef yourself up as early as possible, you theoretically could have run through World 1-1, then 1-2, free Freak in 3-1, finish 5-1, get Poison Cloud from Freak, finish 1-3, and run through 1-4 to poison the Lant to death. This raises a question about boss difficulty that developers must have encountered and were challenged by. And that question is, how difficult can bosses really be? Okay, so what I mean by this is because you can begin and continue your journey after World 1-1 in seemingly any direction, each boss needs to be relatively accessible and possible at any level given the freedom of choice. This doesn't have to be the case, as developers can really railroad you down the more natural pathways, but closing off all other options and making those bosses in later stages unable to be beaten defeats the purpose of having the freedom of choice to begin with. Thus exists this weird balancing act. 
The developers needed to make sure that the world was difficult at every point, but also not too difficult because the players can access all areas early. But they also wanted their players to travel of their own free will and not be railroaded by them. Because if you railroaded them, why open up the archstones and allow for exploration to begin with? On the other hand, bosses have a relative level that they should be tackled at, and as Old King Aland is extremely quick, hits hard and has a ton of health, 5668 to be exact, and can soul suck you, it makes sense that he is, in some ways, considered the last of the Archdemons. After he is down, slowly dying of tuberculosis, we get a message, although, again, I prefer the original dialogue from the remake here. How did you defeat my precious demon? No human has an appetite for souls such as you. The rest is up to the old one. If it is to be, then you shall be back in again. How did you defeat my demonic reflection? How many souls might you have devoured, I wonder? The rest is up to the old one. If it is to be, then you shall be back in again. one has beckoned and we shall answer but before that heading back to the nexus and interacting with this statue here by giving it 25,000 souls gives us access to three things one it allows us to absolve our sins two it gives us a chance to change our appearance which i believe is either based off of how many souls you have or whether or not you've done it before and three Fractured Mode, a mode that is specific only to the remake. Fractured Mode is... interesting. It flips the world horizontally. And on top of that, the world features ceramic coins. 26 to be exact. 26 of which can be dropped at Sparkly the Crow in World 4-1 to receive a rusted key. This rusted key will open a door behind an illusionary wall in World 1-3 for access to the Penetrator armor set. These coins can only be gathered in worlds with either pure white or pure black tendency and as a result of such feat I'm not going to be displaying them throughout this commentary. Although I will say I feel that Fractured Mode divides me in a couple of ways. And on one hand it's a challenge but not really due to its difficulty, it's due to the fact that it just fucks with your senses. I don't consider that exactly difficult but just confusing. It's sort of like saying that tying your shoes is quite difficult when you have to cross your arms. And of course, it's a wacky analogy, but you sort of get the idea. Let's face it, it's a pretty lazy attempt at a gotcha mode for the game. And also, the haptic sensors haven't been swapped, so what the hell's going on with that shit? If I have to dodge a flaming boulder coming down the stairs, and it's on the left of my character, I feel the vibration on the right side. I really honestly just couldn't be asked with this mode. Anyway, off screen I killed old King Doran in the mausoleum from World 1-1 where we got the key from Astrava in World 1-4. I took his stuff because it's one of the best armor sets in the game along with the brushwood gear underneath in pure white world tendency. I employed the same tactic that I used for old King Alan, easy game, easy life really. I just sort of stood back and poisoned his ass. Although I saved myself a lot of pain because Doran is extremely tanky and hits like an absolute machine.
granted thy wish. A new demon. Come now, be good. The Nexus is a hidden temple that effectively binds together the northern lands of Boletaria. As we established earlier, it's the central hub in which five paths branch from, but there is a sixth, right here. This is the Old One, and his domain underneath the Nexus. Prior to the beginning of the story, the kings and queens of the Archstone areas had worked together to seal the Old One here. The Old One can be described basically as a large slug or snake-like creature made up of flora and seemingly other junk. It's an ancient demonic entity that serves as the main antagonist for the game as it exudes a colourless demon fog from which it brings demons. We really have no idea where it came from, but later on we see King Alant call it the poison for the poison. Entering the old one is an easy task. Simply walk in its mouth and chop at the trees to clear the path or roll through them. They reuse this style of entering a lair with a bed of chaos, but for the love of all that is good, let's never bring up that name again. A talisman of beasts item description suggests that the old one is the true form of God and that is worshipped by the faithful and this connection to the soul arts are where miracles come from as well. This is the old one where true King Alant resides. He's an absolute joke of a fight but it's because he's meant to be. He gave up his humanity, driven by a lust of power, and became a demon after he made a pact with the Old One, whereby he'd been twisted and contorted into this abomination, which we see in front of us. King Alan here displays that he was not a suitable vessel for demonic power, and all he can do now is crawl along the ground, barely swinging his sword at you. This boss effectively serves as a cautionary tale to those who desire to walk down a dark path and serve in exchange for power. You will lose everything. As we finally kill King Alan, he spouts more words off to us until he fades into the nothingness. Thy work is done. Slayer of demons, go back above. The Nexus shall imprison thee no longer. I shall lull the old one back to slumber. The Candle Maiden endeavours to lull the old one back to its slumber and with it remove the colourless demon fog that blankets the lands and all the demons that come with it. If we decide to become like King Alan, a more suitable vessel for the Old One, we're to kill the Candle Maiden, but if we trust in her mission, we simply must leave. Each Souls game has multiple endings that the player can experience, and it's only really around the time of Dark Souls 2, Scholar of the First Sin, where endings become more than just a dual choice. As I am not a monster, I trust the Candle Maiden to do her work, and lull the Old One back to sleep. So I exit. one, along with the Maiden, was swept back into the lulling fog. Volataria was spared from the demons, but also lost its knowledge of the soul arts. The souls lost during the pandemonium were never retrieved. And today, the unstable world has another monumental to hold its fabric together. A brave new hero of unprecedented power.
If you have made it this far, then I must extend a hello and a thank you to you. Your time is precious to me. It really, really is. You see, originally I set out to do this commentary because I genuinely really do love Demon Souls and I wanted to discuss many aspects of this game. I understand that there was no plausible way I could have covered everything in a reasonable portion of time. As I played it and continued writing the script and progressing through the creation of this video, I decided that I effectively needed to have a question or two to answer to bring some form of closure to my words throughout. If that indeed is my intention, then I suppose my questions are as follows. Is the Demon Souls remake by Bluepoint Games a true and honest rendition of the original? And is Demon Souls, both the remake and the original, an experience that stands up to this very day? Blue Point Games has taken the code from the original Demon Souls and with it given it a much needed facelift. There are some facets that have been changed, of course. Voice acting has been given an update and is made to be crisp and clear and the music has been overhauled. The graphics are phenomenal in quality and the art style and user interface are even better. In regards to the code from the original, they kept a large portion of it the same, but changed some things. For example, the duplication glitch that I made a video on 10 years ago no longer works. The removal of this glitch saw that others that weren't previously there now were discovered, meaning that perhaps not everything was ironed out properly. Rescuing Yuria now requires the full official set rather than just the cap, yet the AI are still as haphazard and as stupid as they were in the original. Are those changes worthwhile? Are they within the spirit of the original? Well, I mean, looking back, I found myself liking the original voice acting and music more than the remake. The characters, for what it's worth, all say the exact same thing, if not extremely similar things throughout the game, so you're still able to get the story and information from them. The characters, rather than have their own original charm, flaws and personalities, seem to be more grounded and fleshed out, crisp and better sounding, and that impacted the way that I absorbed the world. I, unfortunately, kept subconsciously comparing the voice acting between the two because the original is so thoroughly burned into my brain. As I think I have made clear by now, I obviously prefer the graphical quality that Bluepoint brings to the table, but that isn't to say that better graphics make for a better experience. I still dearly love the old graphics despite their issues, although I am a sucker for these new ones. I would argue that the remake is as true and honest to the original game as it can be without including all of these game-breaking things, aside from the already discovered newer glitches. It mirrors the original in playability very closely, even to a fault at times, so yes, I would confidently say that this is a true and honest rendition of the original, to the best of Bluepoint Games' abilities. It is going to be very difficult to answer this question in such a short amount of time, as effectively this part here could be considered an informal review of the product in comparison to its release. I need to try my best to put my personal bias for this game aside for this section, so please keep that in mind. In the grand scheme of things, very rarely do games withstand the true test of time, as it is natural for media, regardless of the medium, whether TV, film, music or video game, to progress forward into more relevant and updated things. To that I say, Demon's Souls is no different. If I was to compare it to the games that come after it, which I believe is fair as it highlights the improvement in quality over time, then we can pinpoint a few contentious things about the game that stick out like a sore thumb. The biggest change has been to difficulty. Take for example the Flame Lurker or Old King Alant, two of the linchpin examples of peak difficulty within Demon Souls, and compare them to the likes of others in the FromSoft repertoire such as Orphan of Kos, Ishin the Sword Saint, or Melenia Blade of Mikola. Even comparing them to the likes of other bosses just within the Soul series pits them against such wonders as Slave Knight Gale, Dark Eater Medea, Nameless King, Ornstein and Smoff, and Sir Alon. Demon Souls, quite clearly, cannot compare to them in terms of difficulty, and why would it? It's natural as time and players progress that newer games will be more difficult and strategies will be uncovered to help you on your way for old games. Who knows, looking back in 10 years we might find some of the more difficult bosses in the FromSoft series an absolute joke. 
In manner of difficulty, Demon Souls does not stand up to this day, and that's simply a matter of comparison. Does that mean it is easy? No, not at all, but it isn't as difficult to overcome due to the series effectively training us over time. Demon Souls, however, at least the original, has an extremely evocative world. It provokes a large range of emotions and the characters and items you interact with paint an amazing story that connect all of these obscure dots and ask questions that get us thinking. The music was thematic, significant and emotional and my belief was thoroughly suspended throughout the original and to a similar degree the remake. The remake makes improvements on the sound, voice and music quality, but perhaps not the feel. As a result, I find that the original stands up more to this day than the remake will. Graphically, the original looks dated. It's very clear to see that the remake has updated this beyond any person's belief, and it shakes me to my core just how beautiful they have made this experience. Bluepoint Games transformed this world into something brilliant, and obviously due to the nature of technology, the remake will stand up to this very day, but the original is not without its charms. It's simply dated. The characters in the original do look a bit childish and smooth, the bloom effects are unusual and border on being too bright with not much shading or shadowing going on, and the game feels in some ways cartoonish, although I acknowledge that that in itself could be a horrible adjective for the graphical quality of the original. Who knows if that's the correct word for my thoughts really. Graphics don't necessarily make a game better or worse, and really shouldn't be considered too much when looking at the quality of a game overall. This is clear to see with such examples as Majora's Mask, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2, or even newer titles such as Super Mario Galaxy that the graphics, while dated and technologically behind, don't really matter in the long run. So do the graphics matter in the original to me? Not really. It still draws me into the world well enough. The level design throughout both the original and, of course, the remake is fantastic. In Demon's Souls, the levels are often designed in a way where they loop back on themselves and provide shortcuts for the player in the event of a death and occur rather naturally throughout. For example, in World 1 you have gates, in World 2 you have elevators, and in World 5 you have boards. None of them really feel shoehorned in. For example, World 5-2, you run around the level and progress forward along this planked path, exploring more until you uncover a board that you can kick down and unlock a shortcut right back to the beginning. Each one of these shortcuts matched up with the style of the world and the level design is coherent and well thought out. Of course, not all worlds are perfect, but then again, every game in the Soul series has their Achilles heel of a level, so to speak. Demon Souls, both the original and remake, are wonderful games that every Souls fan should attempt to play if they can. Unfortunately, they're both locked behind being console exclusive, which frustrated me because as a fan of FromSoft's creations, I really want them to do well and I want the games that I love and enjoy to be shared to as many as possible. The original and the remake both have wonderfully immersive worlds that draw you in, lovable and hateable NPCs that bind you to them in some way, a fantastic story that's out there to be explored and found, levels that feel mostly fleshed out, and a large range of bosses and enemies throughout varied levels. Unlike the core message behind Demon's Souls, get greedy and absorb as much from this experience as you can. You won't regret it. I promise you. And, on that note, that ends Demon's Souls, a commentary. Thanks for watching.